for joining us this evening. Our webinar today is called How, How to Rebuild Your Practice Now and After COVID-19. Our speaker today is Stuart Gandalf, and he is with Healthcare Success. And my name is Cindy Pankella, and I am the Senior Director of Physician Services at the American Osteopathic Association. Before we get started, um, I'm gonna go over a few housekeeping um, issues. So we'll move the slide and so all of you are muted. If you do have any questions, we ask that you put them into the Q&A box found on your screen. You can type them in at any time during the presentation and then we will address them following the presentation. Uh, if you do have technical diff difficulties, we ask that you put them into the chat box and then I will filter through those and see if there's a way that I can help you with whatever technical difficulties you are having. Both the slides and a recording of this presentation will be available on the AOA's website. Hope to be available for you tomorrow, but um, if not tomorrow, then Monday at the latest. Also, this webinar is being offered for CME. So those that um, registered through the CME platform, you'll go back to that CME platform and take your post-test within the course. Those of you that did not register for CME, if you choose to go back and get the CME for it, you can go to the AOA online learning platform. That's the email or the URL that you see on the screen and register, and then you'll take the post-test so that you can still go for that after the fact. The post-test evaluation will be available at 8.15 Central Time this evening. And I believe, little disclaimer, that obviously this is not legal advice um, and everything was um, accurate and timely at the time the message was, the webinar was crafted. And now I will turn it over to um, Stuart. Hey, thank you, Stuart. <laughs> thank you, Cindy. I'm really pleased to be here, and I see people are still coming on, on board to our webinar together. So we're gonna spend an hour together, and um, I wanna introduce my uh, background in just a moment, but again, I do appreciate you being here. I know this is an important topic for everybody attending and um, just about everybody in private practice. Um, so I also know that we, by experience, have a really broad range of people that are probably attending. We have um, um, uh, people from uh, you know, primary care, specialty care, osteopaths of all kinds. We have people that are working probably in a hospital environment, people that have their own practice, some are working in large enterprise level practices. So, I'll try to make my um, comments work for everybody. Um, also, before we begin, um, you know, we are living through a historic pandemic. Uh, things are changing incredibly fast. Um, Cindy mentioned a minute ago, um, this was all date is the time of the recording. I added a bunch of new things in the last 48 hours to this presentation from some of the ones I've done in the past. So things were changing really quickly. Uh, thank you um, to any of the caregivers in the audience that are on the front lines and thank you to the rest of you who are doing your part to keep our country happy despite the pandemic. Um, make sure we all, whatever our role in this thing is, work hard to protect yourself and your loved ones. Remember also it's not over, so continue to encourage social distancing among pretty much everybody you meet. Um, how we act today will be remembered forever and uh, let's get the word out together and uh, help some patients. So. I'm Stuart Gandalf, I'm Chief Executive Officer of Healthcare Success. We are a marketing agency. Um, what makes us very unique is that we've been working with, uh, in healthcare for 20 years, and I've personally helped over a thousand clients, and uh, lots and lots and lots of DOs during that period, um, and uh, along with MDs, of course, and other specialties or other professions. Um, our team of about 30 people, all they do is market healthcare um, practices and hospitals. So the stuff we talk about today will not just be theory, we're not just consultants. Uh, we work in this world every day 
And uh, certainly while I speak and write a lot and do things like this a lot, um, at the end of the day, this is real world um, advice we're providing to you. So as we get started here, um, the first thing I wanted to raise here is that the states are reopening and my sort of joyous photo is meant for a lot of reasons. Hopefully that's, you're relating to that as potentially the happy family in the picture. It also gives us a sense of some hope for the future and, uh, or that might be your patients, you know, back out, you know, onto the, into the world. But at any rate, you know, it is a sort of a leap forward. And right now we are, um, despite a lot of uncertainty, you need to think about our marketing moves um, to rebuild your practice. Now, if the word marketing scares you, don't worry. Marketing is a pretty broad concept, and we'll talk about that later. And I should mention as well that in my experience, an audience like this will have people that some are extremely marketing savvy. Um, you know, some have worked with uh, agencies like mine, have great big marketing budgets, and, you know, many locations, and, you know, it's more of an institutional. Others, maybe it's a single practice, you know, with a, a small practice with maybe an assistant. So I'm going to try to help everybody on that continuum, uh, no matter how savvy you are or not on marketing, and we're going to do that over the next hour. So uh, I mentioned a minute ago, things are changing. And here's um, an updated map from where we are in terms of reopening. So as you can see, some are uh, already, you know, partially reopened. Others are reopening very soon. And some are shut down or restricted to this day. But even some of the holdouts like California, where I live, are uh, beginning to talk about opening things up at least somewhat. Um, so again, it's very, very um, divided across the country. Uh, a lot of times you hear blue states versus red states. It's that, but it's more. Um, certainly there's a lot of uh, different opinions on this, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So... As I mentioned a moment ago, we are at a time of change, a time that's very unsettling. And so some of the headlines I pulled together in the, uh, most of these are from the last couple of days. This first one was kind of when the, this all even became possible. Of course, we were all advised to um, you know, hold off elective surgeries, uh, protect the PPE, protect patients, you know, um, not overwhelm the system. And so, uh, right around April 17th, um, they, um, immediately thereafter, uh, Becker's ASC News, for example, reported, you know, outpatient elective surgeries to restart under the first stage of Trump's plan. Uh, of similarly, uh, a roadmap from the American uh, Hospital Association came out um, saying that, um, you know, uh, doctors and hospitals can begin to do elective surgeries as the curve flattens. Uh, interestingly, just a couple days ago, how doctors are keeping patients safe as elective surgery resumes. U.S. promise or U.S. hospitals promise new safety measures. So what's happening then is some positive news here, helping ease patient fears about the coronavirus. Uh, Trump says it's safe to reopen states as governors grapple with restrictions, which is obviously related. Uh, but the news isn't all encouraging. Obviously, it's still not over, and so. Uh, a, dead, or a, um, a headline from yesterday, millions of layoffs to push unemployment rate to the highest level since Great Depression. Other articles talk about the 30 million jobs that have been lost in several weeks. Um, in terms of the um, uh, reopening, not everybody's convinced this is a good idea. So U.S. officials warn of new virus surge as states reopen. Models project stark rise in deaths as states reopen. These are, you know, credible sources, Wall Street Journal, New York Times. Um, so there is obviously every state is a little bit different. Um, at the end of the day, you know, the healthcare um, uh, doctors like you are going to make decisions that make sense for your practice and your communities. Um, and then, of course, we have, we've talked about the opening. We've talked about some of the scary news. And then on the financial side, medical practices reel financially from COVID-19 losses. This was a medical economics a couple of days ago. Uh, as visits plummet because of the coronavirus, small physician practices are struggling to survive, again, with the New York Times. So it's a very, very unsettled time. And I want to start then talking about what does this mean to doctors? What's happening from the doctor and practices point of view? Well, first of all, um, and you've talked about this in some other webinars um, from the AOA. Cindy's talked about this with me, and that's great because about half of doctors, depending on the source, I've seen a little bit over half 
Um, Merritt Hawkins is a respected source. They said about 48%. But about a half of practices overall are using telemedicine. That includes specialists, um, generalists, uh, osteopaths, MDs. Um, it, but it's probably, from what I'm seeing, pretty representative of just about everybody. So a lot of practices are. Obviously, some of this was better telemedicine than others. Some it's kind of impossible for. Uh, but about half of practices are using telemedicine. Interestingly, 38% of physicians uh, are seeing COVID cases, and of those are feeling a lot of stress, apparently, 30% of them, uh, but they say they'll continue to see patients. Um, about two-thirds of the patient, or the doctors who are not seeing COVID patients say they were willing to do so, uh, which hopefully, hopefully we won't have any more surges, but if we do, it sounds like those doctors ready and able to assist. Um, 14% of doctors say they're challenged on plan changing their setting, the way they're doing business. And sadly, 18% say they plan to retire, temporarily close, or just opt out of patient care. So again, just lots and lots of change going on. The, um, some new stats here in terms of ambulatory care and ambulatory visits just overall. Now I recognize we have very different, you know, we probably have orthopedic surgeons on the uh, webcast, um, primary care and kind of everything in between. But again, overall, about 60% uh, decline in ambulatory visits um, in recent weeks. And what's interesting is uh, nearly 30% of all visits uh, and ambulatory practices are now provided by telemedicine. However, um, as the number of tele, uh, visits, telehealth is helping, but it's not enough to replace the volume. So it's partially offsetting the loss of physical patients, but it's just not enough. Again, talking about specialties, not surprisingly, it's, it's hard to do ophthalmology without seeing the patient. Uh, it's hard to do that through telemedicine. Uh, a lot of that isn't urgent. So big, big drop-offs in things like ophthalmology, otolaryngology, um, you know, there's been drops across the board, but obviously some specialties are hit harder than others. MGMA came out with a survey recently about the financial impact, and sadly, this was back on April 7th, it's probably much, much worse now. 97% um, of practices said they are experiencing a negative financial impact, directly or indirectly, related to COVID. 55% decrease in revenue, 60% decrease in patient volume. Um, I wish I had a live audience I could see you. I bet I'd see a lot of nodding heads right now. And projected layoffs, 36% and 60% furloughs. Um, really, really, really tough numbers today. And so my job today is to help you as much as I can with that. Finally, um, and I know this is depressing, but we have to talk about the truth here. 95% of practices in California, this is the California Medical Association, said they were worried about their financial health. Uh, extremely worried, 46, you know, basically half said they were extremely worried, and what, 76% were very or extremely worried. So that's really, really uh, disturbing. And if you were to read through all these, these are just some sample uh, comments that the doctors gave, um, you know, doomsday, it's very scary. So again, uh, there, are, there are things we can do. We are not, and some things I will share with you today that can help. So I recently did another webinar where they had pulling was a little easier. The numbers we saw were about 5% never really stopped. About 20% had resumed in the last, um, uh, resumed back to full, they were doing procedures, but about 20% had resumed procedures in the last week or so. Another quarter expect to do it in the next week or so. About 35% expect to open up only by June 30, and roughly 15% said they plan on opening after June 30. So I know from experience and working with doctors like we do, it's really a mixed bag. Um, for your practice, you know, I'm not a clinician, and obviously you know your practice a lot better than I do. So uh, people ask me, what should I do? And it's like, well, obviously there's a lot of things to consider. There's available and applicable state orders and restrictions. Um, you can look to the guidelines that are put out you know, by AOA and others. Um, COVID infection rate locally is a big part of this, of course. How prepared are you? In fact, Cindy and I were talking offline about that and how do you interpret the guidelines and how do you prepare? Um, the economics related because some practices are easier to open now than others. And uh, the doctor's comfort level. Some may feel like, well, I'm able to open, and, but I still don't feel comfortable. I don't think it's good yet for the broad population. And then of course, consumer demand, which is the great big question mark. So speaking of consumers, 
drinking some water here. We have the consumers obviously have a big role here. This is the best photo I could find for work at home. Some of you may be able to relate to this. Um, Americans, as I mentioned earlier, are extremely divided. I mean, some of you may have seen the uh, near riot in Michigan where the protesters with guns came and you know, they either A, feel like it's time to end social distancing or B, just don't even believe in the coronavirus. And you know, the, it seems to be coming into the media now. So uh, some people feel like the situation is getting better, some think it's getting the same, some feel like it's getting worse, but um, it really is divided in many, many ways. So looking at the, some data, these again are very trusted sources. This happens to be from McKinsey. Uh, and these are as up to date as is possible. I spent, I don't know, two days preparing for this webinar. The, um, so not only how long the situation will last, the economy, overall public health and the health of myself and my family, um, all of these people, uh, over half to two thirds, felt very concerned or extremely concerned. So that tells you that your patients are really, really um, not there yet in terms of feeling comfortable. Um, in terms of the economic side of this, uh, I've seen various stats from various sources. This one shows about half said that they are strongly agree with, um, I'm very careful how I'll spend my money. Usually I see between 60 to 70% say they will be cutting back significantly on major purchases. So these kinds of numbers are consistent from many different sources. Now, that'll have more impact and less impact based on the style of practice, right? So if you have a heavy surgery-based practice with a lot of people with high deductible insurance plans, they're gonna pay more out of pocket, that will have an impact more than somebody who's just getting co-pays for family office visits. Likewise, interestingly, if you, Americans, when you ask them, when, how long it will take to get back to a routine, 91% said two months or more, and 14% said over a year. Meanwhile, in terms of the economic impact being subsided, their personal impact, 72% uh, said at least two months of disruption, 16% more than a year. So again, there's just some consumer hesitancy here. Now, another thing that's not surprising is that uh, consumer behaviors are changing. So while 70% are delaying major purchases, there is some good news here. If you want to market, 95% of consumers say they're spending more time on home media consumption. Uh, two thirds are watching more news. Half are spending more time socializing with their family. Half are watching more streaming shows like Netflix. Uh, about half are watching more broadcast TV. And 48% uh, um, are watching more streaming TV. We'll talk about that later. Lots more time on social media. Um, again, this, uh, what's interesting about this is just from talking to people we know and on the, both on the professional side and just this personal side, uh, you know, some people, families are really pulling together. I'm lucky. My kids and my family and I are using this time and it's, it's going well. Others are having a hard time adapting to this. So, uh, again, these are all just the behaviors we see. I thought this was an interesting slide. Um, when you look at how these things are changing over time, what's going to be just we're suffering and we're going to put up with it, and what things are like, whoa, whoa, we should do this more often. Well, as it turns out, the one I highlighted here, telemedicine for physical, you know, basically what you do, 180% user growth due to telemedicine, and of those, half intend to continue. That is a landmark change. Again, we're not gonna redo the telemedicine seminars you may have seen, but it's just, it's just so true. And not just in terms of billing and coding and you know, seeing patients as an alternative source of revenue. From a marketing standpoint, it allows new opportunities. It's a way to show that your practice is leading edge. It's a way to get patients that would not go to you if they did not have telemedicine. It's a way even to do offers where if you're doing elective procedures, you could do a consultation through telemedicine. It'll only get easier and better over time. So that's really important to know that, that part has changed. And then finally, as you start to wrap up these stats, again, now patients, how long will it take them to return to care? Um, you know, some said I'll go today, some said immediately, after the pandemic ends, some say more than a month after that. Um, but it is very interesting across the board, whether it's a hospital, urgent care, outpatient, or wherever, these numbers are similar. And my wife, for example, is getting a procedure next week um, because we feel like, okay, the epidemic here where we live is pretty much under control. Uh, we trust the facility we're going to to take care of us, and she just wants to get it done. 
uh, and it's, but it's across the board. The, um, some good news, I know I've hit you with a lot of not as fun good news. Uh, this is some good news. So looking ahead, when respondents were asked, would you be willing to reschedule and come in earlier uh, to uh, appointments that you've postponed, the 57% said I would if the provider is available. And 38% said essentially they would as long as they feel like the site is um, safe and they're less likely to get the disease there. And that's a big one right here. If you're taking notes, star this. 50% um, said that I would uh, likely respond favorably if my doctor's office called me to reschedule. So that's a homework next step. If you get nothing out of this webinar, um, when you go back to patients who have postponed or canceled or it's time to come in for routine care, um, this would be the time to um, call them, email them, text them, and follow up because about half um, say they're open to it. So here's some takeaways from all that consumer research. This, I'm referring here to a model by Everett Rogers. This is something that one of the reasons why I fell in love with marketing and undergrad um, was this concept right here. So the Diffusion of Innovations was created to look at the adoption of technology. So if you look at um, VHS tapes and VCRs, and if you look at uh, DVDs and laser video and now streaming or set, uh, mobile phones uh, translating into smartphones, it, there's something bizarre about this, but these are predictable trends. So about in this, and in fact, I would argue based upon my experience uh, working with you know thousands of doctors over the years, there's probably some that fit this curve as well in terms of adopting new procedures. So about two and a half percent are just love being at the at the leading edge. They're just that way in their life. Um, and then there's the early adopter phase. Uh, this is where I fit in my own world in terms of adopting technology. I feel like let somebody else get the arrows. <laughs> Um, but I'm still pretty early in the process. I like technology. I like, uh, I like them to sort out the bugs first, um, but I'm pretty leading edge. I'm not leading edge, but leading edge. And I have a lot of doctors I speak with feel the same way. Um, then there's the early majority. And enough people have tried it, they feel good. Then there's the late majority, and then there's the laggers. And so this model is famous in the world of marketing. Um, it's a really good way to look at, you know, kind of where consumers are in readiness. And I would argue that even though this isn't technology, you're gonna see this with consumers. There's gonna be some people that first thing, you like, let me in, it's like ready to go. So the innovators and early adopters will rush in, then the early majority might wait a month or so, late majority and laggards may take some time. It's just going to be a wide mix. So, the, um, so some patients, again, will see you now, others are just gonna take more time. We can, and we'll see, hopefully we won't get a big rebound from the opening states that opened aggressively and perhaps a little too soon. Um, so we'll see. Uh, some people are wanting to wait and see. Some people feel like I'm ready to go. Um, so we're going to see this happen over time. Again, remember patients are uh, still worried about getting sick by being treated. Some patients are really concerned about spending money. Uh, but the final comment was, again, if you can actively, you know, take an active effort to let them know that you're there, um, they are likely to be open to seeing you. The... Um, as we go forward, as we start to communicate, I'm gonna tell you what to do here now. We're moving away from research and into what to do. Um, so anything you do in terms of social media or advertising or whatever else, um, these are some of the things that we do for our clients that you can do uh, for yourself on a smaller scale or perhaps on a grand scale. But generally always acknowledge the current situation wherever possible. It just sounds out of touch um, to not. Be transparent. Um, Look at if you're doing any marketing, scenes of large crowds, handshakes, parties, just look out of touch. Be very careful of looking exploitative. Um, it's possible to do that even if it's not your attention. Make sure you don't have any intended words, like, you know, we're dying to see you. Obviously that's an uh, extreme example, but uh, you wanna make sure that they're all, everything you do cannot be misinterpreted. Have empathy, people are grieving, right? So. I'm guessing a fair number of, uh, of the people in this audience today are grieving over the economic fortunes of their business. Um, some probably are doing really well. Some people are grieving over people who have died. Um, you know, it's a really big problem. Um, have empathy of other doctors when you speak to them. Have empathy, it's just, it's a common, um, it's important to know that we're all grieving here. It really is. So, with all that said, and everything I went through in terms of where we are today, and again, there's some optimism here, right? We're all here, we're talking about this new topic. 
the question is, well, Stuart, should we hold off on our marketing until things, you know, we're fully operational, things are back to normal, right? And I would argue, no. <laughs> uh, I would not argue, I would argue, do not um, stop marketing or refuse to start marketing. Uh, but depending on your situation, it may sense to hold off, may make sense to hold off on advertising, right? So marketing, yes, advertising, maybe depending on the situation. So as a, as a reminder, because most people don't know this or don't think of it this way, traditional advertising is just one piece of the marketing mix. Um, when we work with our clients, we create marketing plans for most of them. And we go through what are your objectives, what is your competitive situation, what makes you unique, what's your strengths, weaknesses, and opportunities and threats, uh, what's your um, target audience and budget, all those kinds of things. But then we break it down into these six categories. So um, if, another thing that's a, one of our favorite articles from our blog is um, just break down your marketing into these six categories forevermore. So internal marketing, which is a close cousin of patient experience, so those are all the things you can do with your patient base. Doctor referral building is for specialists, key. Primary care, I mean, if you're a specialist getting doctor referrals from primary care, very, very important. Obviously, if you're a primary care, not so much. Digital marketing is the favorite level we use as an agency. Um, now, by the way, we can solve on all this stuff. Uh, and, uh, but um, digital marketing is where we, most of our clients invest most of their budgets because it's usually the best place to start. Traditional advertising uh, makes sense for some businesses. Branding makes sense for everybody. Whether or not you're trying to, you have a brand. It's just a question of is it the one you want. And public relations includes things like getting free press, community events, um, you know, being out there in the public, that kind of stuff. So even if you're currently closed, I want you to take this opportunity to invest in the long term. So this applies to everybody. So why should you do that? Well, first of all, a lot of your competitors and colleagues are frozen, they're doing nothing. So depending on your business, usually most of us wanna survive and thrive into the future. And um, so, and there's a lot of things you can do at very low cost if that's an issue for you. So I'd recommend that you take that. Also, your job is to at least plan for and prepare for the future. So, so what can you do now uh, and invest in? What, you know, if you're closed and plan to stay closed? Well, first of all, Make sure, because I still see this, that you have an up-to-date COVID-19 notice on your site. Um, I just went to one of our clients' sites and saw this notice we put together with them. Um, you know, very specific, very clear, you know, when they plan to reopen. Um, you know, this is great stuff. You know, having it on the website, uh, having it on the homepage with links, pop-ups or whatever. But that's something you just have to do. Um, if you're gonna do marketing planning, this is a great time if you're less busy. Um, if you've been meaning to get around to branding or creative work or a new website, great time for that. Long-term digital marketing projects I'll describe in a minute. For those of you that are more enterprise level sites um, or practices of many locations or a hospital environment, then it becomes you know, a much bigger issue to keep your employees and providers on the same page. If, you've got, if you're a small practice with you know, one single doctor and a couple of assistants and you know, maybe an extender, that's a little easier. It's easier. You don't need to send them an email to think about this. But in large organizations, keeping everyone on the same page is crucial. And then updating your social media and emailing patients. And I'll talk about that in a sec. So another thing you can do right now is to use the organic social media to uh, build your reputation and help sub save lives, even if you're closed. So uh, in a speech I did a few weeks ago, I noted that the U.S. Surgeon General trying to get the word out about social distancing, trying to get the word out about staying at home, came out on um, CBS, uh, one of the morning programs, and talked about getting Kylie Jenner, who has four million Instagram followers, to jump into the fray and tell her followers about the seriousness of social distancing. And guess what? A couple of hours later, she did. So when you think about the power of social media, where the sur Surgeon General is relying on you know, a Kardashian relative to get the word out about social distancing. And then it works, it's pretty amazing. But I would argue, where's our heart doctors? Where's our hospitals? Where's our providers, right? So it's great that Kylie um, you know, helped out here, but you know, all of us, anybody in healthcare, I would argue has a responsibility to continue to get the word out about public safety, social distancing, even if you're in a state where you're opening things up, nobody has, nobody has said, you know, run around and ignore social distancing. Nobody has said, with any credibility at least, uh, ignore safety. 
So it's important now as much as ever to make sure people are aware that um, social distancing and safety still matter. Um, you can take a leadership position to your patient base and others who know, see your, uh, your Instagram and Facebook uh, by letting them know what to do if they think they may have the virus. I just saw today for the first time that I can remember here in California, which is about as advanced as you can get in, this, in some regards for most things, finally saw a clear website where you can find local testing in Orange County where it was all in one place. It wasn't just a bunch of internet searching, but there is now something set up. So providing wellness tips or where people should go, um, assuring the public that you are taking the proper safety precautions, answer frequently asked questions. Now, um, blogs and patient emails um, are really the three of them are sort of a triumvirate. You wanna have good, strong content on your website on blogs, promote it to your patient base through emails, promote it to your patient base and anybody else will see it through social media. By the way, this is just a series of free um, social media ads that we've created. If you're interested in those, email at the end of this thing and I can send you a, a little packet of things that we have. Um, they're on the creative side and fun side, but you have, you're welcome to have those if you like. But again, organic social media, you can do that on your own. It doesn't cost anything. One limitation of organic uh, social media though is it takes a lot of work to get a thousand followers. And of those, any maybe 20 or 40 or 50 might see any specific posts. So it's, you should do it, but it's not gonna blow your doors down with lots of new patients. But still, it's something you can do that's positive. Interestingly, I was on a webinar yesterday on the hospital side. My friend Mike Schneider is head of Greystone uh, Consulting. They do create a con uh, do a lot of things, but healthcare internet conference is something they do. So at the enterprise level, uh, they interviewed hospitals, and sure enough, what did they? What were the hospitals finding were the most effective? Oh, exactly what Stuart just said works for practices. So social media, email marketing, blog posts, these are the things that are the most important things to do and most effective things to do during the pandemic. So let's switch gears a little. Let's talk about, let's say you're open now. Um, what should you do then? Well, um, I'm gonna go through with you a variety of different marketing strategies that you can do. Again, we're going from easy to more sophisticated and rough order. So the first thing you can do is, again, update your COVID uh, notice because you're no longer saying you're closed, you're saying you're coming in. So make sure that's the first thing to do is update the notice on your website. Secondly, I would argue strongly that you should create a video, even if it feels amateurish to you, um, about your safety procedures. This happens to be from a hospital, but you can do this too. You can either uh, simply, and most people are used to Zoom by now, you can do something really gorilla by getting your staff and team on a, the same page where you know, each person talks about you know, you're the doctor, you're gonna talk about what you're taking, your uh, PA or your nurse practitioner talks about what he or she is doing, your you know, receptionist or whomever, taking turns talking about how you're gonna keep people safe in the office. Obviously, if you're an institutional um, business and you have a little bit more budget, you can get done professionally, you can do this with an iPhone. Don't let the technology slow you down. Patients, especially if you're in a smaller practice, patients don't even expect you to be slick. And, some of you, especially osteopaths, you know, just sort of philosophically are a bit more homey and friendly, um, natural sort of feeling. So um, those patients will love you for that. Um, so make sure you do that. Call and text patients, as I mentioned earlier, who postponed your visits. Uh, you wanna make sure that you do that to get them to reschedule. Email again is a super powerful tool to get the word out. Um, one of the sad, sad things about working with doctors for so long Email is not a new technology. If I, the average practice I talk to does not have their emails organized with patients. If there's ever a time to do that, do that. It's not illegal. Um, as long as you let them know that it's who it's coming from, it's clear that it's, uh, um, you know, what the nature of it is, it's not misleading, and it has your address on it. There's some rules on this called can spam. Um, you know, now you may decide that you want to ask them to opt out. Um, but, you know, right now in the world of a pandemic, uh, as long as you're doing this in a HIPAA way, I should say a HIPAA protected way, um, you know, it's a good idea. Make sure you don't do anything to violate HIPAA. Um, oh, if you do do email, I would say another thing that's key 
is to have a link to your uh, safety page and on the video as well. Some businesses are really good at this. My wife goes to a functional medicine doctor. I'm not sure if she's a DOMD, um, but at least with sort of a functional integrative approach. And um, she's just great at this. My wife loves listening to her uh, podcast. She does a, uh, a simple little videos when she's at conferences. Right now she's sending out updates. It's been very, very valuable to her. You know, uh, at the early stages of this, when they said, see your doctor, she emailed their patient base saying, no, that's not the right thing to do at this stage. We're not equipped for this. Here's what you should do instead. And instead of being intrusive, it built the relationship with, between my wife and the doctor. So I know you may not have done this, but I'm just telling you there's some opportunity here. And then, you know, the old fashioned asking patients for referrals. So as patients begin to come back, um, if it were me, I would say, hey, did you good, have a good visit today? Oh my gosh, it was wonderful. Feel safe here? Absolutely. And hey, if that's the case, uh, and you have other friends that are afraid to see the doctor and they don't have any place to go, please send it, you know, let them know, help, let, them, let us help them just like we just helped you. You'll be shocked. Your patients will be thrilled to help. So these are really basic, basic things that you can do uh, without spending a lot of money. Um, and preparing for this, I'm giving you a bonus section here. This is something I spend when I, we do seminars uh, a few times a year. And again, we're an agency, not an educator, but we love educating. So I usually spend about a half an hour on this topic because it's so important and 95% of practices are so bad. Um, they're, you know, people will get hung up on, they're left on hold forever, they're treated rudely, sometimes they're told the doctor's not very good. It's so vital to your, your success, especially now, I'm gonna give you some bonus content. So first of all, uh, when you have your team beginning to answer the phone again, make sure that they assure the patients that COVID precautions are uh, in place to ensure their safety. And as I mentioned, my wife and I are gonna be going in for elective procedure next week. And I've already asked her, so what are the safety precautions? What are, you know, how do we prepare? Will they give us masks? You know, patients want to know that. Make sure your team is scripted. They have this down. They feel confident. Um, it's really vital to your success. Set up your team to succeed now by, you know, educating them. And in the future, the one thing that most doctor's offices do is they hire the cheapest person. They give them a thousand competing tasks. And then the phone call becomes just simply something to get done as quickly as possible. Instead, train them, hire right, pay right, um, and then track the inquiries, how well they do at getting patients to come in. Um, keep note that new patient inquiries are typically the highest priority. Um, today, every patient inquiry is a priority. Um, but know that new patient inquiries are especially difficult. Why? It's not because you're a bad doctor because you had to advertise or they found you on the internet. It's just they have no relationship with you. So you wanna make sure your team is ready to go, especially with those new patient inquiries. In busy offices for new patients, I recommend getting a call off the front desk, especially with something more complicated. Um, you know, if they have a lot of questions, you know what, I tell you what, Cindy is our patient ambassador, new patient ambassador. She's terrific at answering these kinds of detailed questions. Let me get, uh, she's in a quiet office. Let me put you in touch with her. That's fantastic because she had the time to meet with the patient. Um, really important. If your office sounds and feels harried, your patient is assuming that your office is really harried. Um, tell your team and teach your team for new patient calls, at least the objective is a first visit. Nominate your best people to be on the phone for new patient inquiries and be sure to get them in quickly. So this is always important, but today with COVID, I just thought I would spend just an extra moment or two. This sounds so basic. Just think about this. I, if you spend, uh, let's say, $10,000 for a marketing program and it brought in 100 calls and you converted half, you could argue you wasted $5,000. But I would argue those 50 that you wasted times the amount of dollars they brought in could have been hundreds of thousands of dollars of wasted revenue and opportunity cost. So just having done this for many years in mystery shopped many, many practices, uh, it's boring, it's not exciting, but still it's an area worth looking at. If you're concerned about this area, um, something you can do easily is st um, script to this effect. Um, good morning, Dr. Gandalf's office. This is Cindy. How may I help you? It's just a simple, strong, positive greeting. Um, always get them to discover the need. Um, we talk about establishing value. Oh my gosh, Mrs. Jones, I'm so glad you called. And I certainly understand your concerns about COVID. But let me tell you what, we take the greatest precautions here. We've 
make sure that nobody's allowed to enter the building if they have a fever. We do this, we do that. We provide masks to people when they come in. We have to sterilize the office frequently and whatever else. But the greatest thing of all is you're going to love Dr. Jones. She's fantastic. She's the most caring person. She's my doctor too. You'll love her. So let me see. I have Monday morning or Tuesday afternoon available. What's better for you? So that you can tell has been scripted. <laughs> that is something that works. Uh, what I just did there at the end was a dual alternative close. I answered the objections about COVID. I established value. So these are the kinds of things that make a huge difference in your bottom line because it doesn't cost you anymore to do the phone right versus to do the phone wrong. Okay, so moving on. So those were internal things. If you're a specialist, again, about 40% of osteopaths are um, uh, specialists. So if you're in that category, number one, first thing to do is review and prioritize your past referral sources. Hint, most specialists wildly un, um, overestimate how well they know who's referring to them. Um, I see this all the time. Uh, what happened to Joe? He's my friend. I go golfing with him. And you go check the records, and he hasn't, inter he hasn't seen a case in two years. Well, it could be that Joe doesn't know um, that they're not referring. They've created a list, and the front desk doesn't like your office, and you're not getting anybody. So it's really important to audit, see who stopped referring, see if you can fix that. Um, redevelop your relationships. See who has potential. Maybe somebody's referring a ton to you and you've never said boo to them. So this, again, people are slower. There's opportunity here. This is a great time to reestablish relationships. And I would say on these, uh, as you reach out, as, and again, most, both, most doctors have more time these days, reach out to them by phone or text, email, whatever's appropriate. But remember, ask how they're doing, right? They're under stress just like you are. So it's a perfect excuse to rebuild your relationships. On the primary care side as well, there's no reason you can't reach out to your uh, referring doctors. We're all in this together, especially in the healthcare community, right? So uh, do it from that standpoint. It's not begging for referrals, it's keeping the relationships alive. Um, a concept we've been talking about for years is physician liaisons. Now in the old, old days, when I started doing this 20 years ago, I used to spend a lot of time trying to teach the doctor on how to go out and build relationships. And in a group of, say, 20 doctors, there's usually one that likes that and is good at it, but usually everybody else wants to throw things at me. Stuart, I became a doctor, so I don't have to do that stuff. So instead of doing that for most practices then, um, physician liaisons is a concept borrowed from hospitals. Um, it's now being done routinely by big orthopedic groups, big cancer groups, uh, even individual practices, uh, sometimes have physician liaisons. That's a whole topic in and of itself. If you're interested in this kind of stuff, you can email me and I can point you to some blog posts about how do you hire the right person, fire them, um, you know, train them, recruit them, who's good, who's not. A little hint, a clinician who has sales skills is great. A clinician who doesn't have people skills is wrong. Um, there's all kinds of mistakes in this category, but the right person can rock at a practice. Um, also, another thing that we're seeing, there's a big transition now towards uh, people who just can't get in, right? So practices are getting bigger, more corporate, clearly. Um, people have policies against, you know, not just drug reps, but physician liaisons. So there are a lot of things you can do digitally to reach doctors on a one-by-one -one basis. And again, that's something that if you're interested in, uh, just send me an email, I'll send you a link to a webinar I did like two weeks ago on that topic. Uh, it's a big topic, it's a long topic, I don't have time today. Uh, again, this is all free stuff I can provide to you in the spirit of helping. Uh, but there are some digital things you can do to stay in touch at scale with referring doctors and to meet and build relationships with new doctors. So uh, we've covered internal marketing. We covered doctor referrals. Let's talk about digital marketing, one of my very, very favorite areas to talk about. Um, today, by the way, we're not going to talk about branding uh, or um, PR, but we are talking about digital marketing advertising next. So with digital marketing, um, again, you know, the world has come to the web. Most people, um, different, depending on the stat you see, up to 90% of people have looked, you know, research doctors online, both websites and um, reviews. And today, I think the last stat I saw on this, about 70% of people will research a doctor online, even if they're being referred by their primary care doctor. So the website is the center. It's your front door now. Think about it as if, would you have a front door to your office and they walk into moldy, filthy, muddy carpet? 
Um, well, before they get to your front door, if your website's a mess, that's muddy, dirty, filthy carpet. So the website is the beginning of everything today. It's the epicenter of marketing. So either update your website or create a new one. Again, I know the cash may be tight, but you have the time and focus on this and presuming that you're committed to staying in business and you're gonna do this anyway, it's a great time to do this. There's low cost solutions and high cost solutions out there. Um, there's templated versions. Uh, some way, somehow, you know, get the website um, updated. Search engine optimization. When I speak about this, um, search engine optimization is all about getting free traffic from Google and Bing and everybody else. And so SEO is a long-term, never-ending race. So if you looked, I looked up today, medical marketing, and my SEO guy called me, at least here in California, but probably nationally, we're number one for medical marketing. Um, I have competing agencies call me, and they say, how did you do this? You're up, you know, you're top of Google for hospital marketing, medical marketing, doctor marketing, physician marketing, urology marketing, you know, all these kinds of terms. And the reason is, is because I've been doing this for 14 years, and we know what we're doing. But that didn't happen the first day. But the great news is, if you start building uh, search engine optimization, you're committed to it, and now would be a great time to take money you were formerly spending on advertising and putting into SEO, um, because it's long term. So you may not see the benefit of it right away, but it's long term and you never ever want to stop SEO. Um, you want to create a system to improve your online reviews. There's multiple options out there. Uh, we use one that um, can help um, encourage the positive ones to review uh, in an ethical way. Uh, but in any event, whichever system you use, you want to make sure you look at that. That's a huge area. Again, yet another topic for a webinar. Uh, that I may do in the future. Um, organic social media posts I referred to earlier. This is stuff you can do right away. Just recognize it's mostly gonna be your patient base who sees it. So those are all things you can do on your own. So hopefully those were helpful to you. I try to give you a lot of, even if you're on a tiny little budget, um, to give you a lot of things you can walk away from and make an impact and um, you know to your practice now, because that's really important. I know we have some small practices on the line, those are all things you can do that are beneficial. Um, and you can expand that idea. You can do, for example, um, you, know, you can start doing webinars and get your patients involved and talk about wellness and um, you know, post your webinars on YouTube or um, do Facebook Live. So there's some clever ways you can start doing this as well. But I'm gonna move on because we don't just have small practices here. We have practices that are mid-sized and larger and you know, or small that wanna be larger. So I'm gonna cover some of the stuff that we do every day. So the, um, does digital or traditional advertising make sense for you now? Well, we talked about this a little earlier. It could make sense for you if A, first of all, you're open and you wanna attract patients now quickly, then absolutely um, digital advertising in particular makes sense. Or let's say you're closed um, or mostly closed, but you wanna build market share while others are fleeing the market. We see this a lot right now. You want to position yourself as a community thought leader and you really want to help educate the public. Again, we see this a lot right now with hospitals, but not just hospitals. Our hospital clients are doing this, addiction treatment centers are doing this, skilled nursing, practices, all of you can do, take an active role in make, helping the community get better. If you want to build your brand for the long term and capitalize on your competitor's absence from the marketplace, so those are all reasons why you would begin doing advertising. Again, this we've made a switch here to advertising. Um, where did that go? Uh, oh, and you enjoy a reasonable marketing budget. I don't know why it's doing that. Sorry, we're gonna jump to the slide. Um, so when would it not make sense? Well, probably not if you can only invest in direct response advertising where every dollar has to return immediately trackable return on investment or if you're struggling financially. I'm Those sorry, Stuart, we can't, it, you lost the full screen. Yeah, no, I had to back off because my um, screen was, um, it was bouncing for some reason. Let me see if oh, it goes back okay. to full screen now. Are we good? Cindy, can you see that? Sorry, yes, much better, thank you. Good, thank you. So now I recognize that some of you are very, very savvy at this stuff, but others are not. So I'm gonna take just a um, one minute primer. So. When we talk about advertising, there's, there's a, I'm gonna share with you the most uh, impactful, um, especially if you're you know, small to mid budget. Uh, but really this is at the heart of a lot of what we do for clients. 
So the first thing is there are paid ads. These are called pay-per-click ads or paid search. These are the first ads you see on top of Google. And sometimes I have doctors tell me, well, I never push those. I know they're ads and I just don't want to go to those. That's fine. But clearly billions of people do go to that. And that's 80% of the Google fortune is this right here. All that other stuff is great, but the real money uh, Google makes is from all these people clicking the ads. Now, the way this works is ads are prioritized based upon not just budget, but how good the ads are, how well they're clicked, how relevant it is to the search, and how uh, good the experience is on the other end once they click through. So you pay literally by click. So that means that, that you don't pay if they become a patient. You don't pay if they just see the ad. You pay only if they click. Um, so that's a huge area. And what's great about pay-per-click is, well, there's a lot of things, but one of the things is you can get up on top of Google like immediately almost. So we have clients, we, you know, we can get them up on Google at the top right away. Very, very powerful tool. Uh, again, there's a lot here. This is something else we could spend an hour talking about, but pay-per-click has a lot of advantages. There's some disadvantages too, but it's, it's a great place to start for a lot of practices. Second category on the search page, these, in the industry, we call these SERPs, S-E-R-P, in the results page. This is the local map pack we call it in the trade. Usually there's three people here. This is a whole other game. To be good at this is different than what I just showed you. These are two different strategies. This is technically organic, which means you're not getting Google money. And so you can either pay for clicks or you can pray for clicks. But there is a complete strategy to make this. And in the third category, we call these the natural results. These are underneath the map pack. So which of these three do you want to be in? Well, if I had a point tool, we would find out what you say, but I'll just go to this punchline. You want all three. We're pigs. Um, at least I'm a pig. I want all three. When I'm working with my clients, I want to be all three places. I want to dominate. That's how you succeed in internet marketing. Um, another thing I wanted, that was the desktop version. I just want to show you how important the ads are um, for um, on mobile. Mobile, by the way, in our experience, the heavy duty stuff is about 50-50 desktop versus mobile. Like, you know, cancer is well researched. It's um, more contemplative. Uh, the easier stuff like primary care, urgent care, vein removal, those kind of things are about two thirds mobile today. So consumers are heavily, heavily, heavily using mobile. And what's interesting about it is given the limited real estate, you can see how important those ads are because you're dominating these first few things are dominating you don't you have to really work to get down to those natural listings this particular snapshot I have here is only one paid ad a lot of times you'll see two or three paid ads taking up all the real estate so if you're in this Google paid search game um, first of all it's usually the fastest and most cost-effective method to get patients this is not I'm not giving you a rule here, it varies. Every practice is different, every situation. I'm not giving you, just like I don't give legal or medical advice, I'm not giving you marketing advice, because uh, I don't know you. But generally speaking, it's often the first place we look. It's because it's what I tell clients is, it's a annuity that works over and over again. So I'm gonna share with some of you some of my secrets from the, our team working with um, probably 100 campaigns running right now. Um, so what we were seeing, first of all, our digital team has noticed that a lot of elective-based inquiries are down. So clicks are up. People are still looking for medical services, but they may not be inquiring as much. Um, so people are still interested. They just are a little hesitant to call. Now, you can help part of that by having a really good safety notice on your website. Um, but my presumption is it's going to take a while before things return to normal there. Some specialties are actually seeing increased uh, or conversions like urgent care, addiction, primary care are actually doing better um, as a whole. Not everybody's individual results may vary. Um, some categories like, you know, we do a lot with oncology. Those are holding strong. Uh, orthopedic surgery, those kinds of things hold strong. Uh, although the, um, we're just beginning to turn on orthopedic surgery mostly because most of that was elective. Um, the uh, search phrases, we're seeing things like preventative care, immune system. Uh, we do predict a better buys on Google because the market has gotten so soft. Um, some recommendations, if you have something up and running, um, whether it's your marketing agency, most of you probably have that, hopefully. Um, make sure your keywords are focused on action-based specific items. So I don't want searches like, what is an osteopath right now? 
I want a search like doctor near me or DO near me. Terms that are very, very action-based. Uh, don't waste money on what we call research terms. You want action-based terms. Uh, make sure the ads read appropriately for the new reality. Closely monitor your campaigns and be prepared to pivot. Uh, make sure your team makes adjustments to the landing pages and the campaigns as appropriate. Keep in mind that Google does not let you uh, capitalize on COVID, which would be pretty quasi-ethical anyway. Um, telemedicine is big, so if you have telemedicine, it's something to think about. Um, and if you're at the higher end of the scale and you're more experienced, we are having a success with some of the other things like uh, programmatic display, native advertising, which means advertising as though it's um, sort of advertorial, YouTube, there's other places to go. Note, both Google and Facebook, if you've been advertising for a while, are talking about, though I haven't seen this happen, providing some credits um, to some advertisers. I mentioned uh, my favorite things in the marketing world are, you know, to start, that I can control, again, are digital usually. And digital, the first places within digital are uh, paid search, like we just discussed, and then paid social. Because you can reach, instead of reaching a few hundred people from your uh, friends and followers on your web, um, so, uh, social media page, you can meet tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people through paid ads. Um, extremely effective depending on this practice, it just depends. We, again, work with really every single specialty. I should have put up our page. Any specialty you could imagine we've worked with before, and often many, many times. So um, the, um, this can be a really good strategy because you're pushing the message out to people who are not necessarily looking for help, whereas search is all about people who are looking for help. Um, so uh, if you're asking which social media platform, it's paid uh, Facebook and Instagram. Those are the ones. Make sure the ads are relevant and appropriately emotional. Consider Facebook Live and other virtual events. Um, Google is, or Facebook is pushing Facebook Live, which is doing live recordings. Um, again, push telehealth. Um, a new exciting opportunity is something called messenger ads, where it's sort of like a chat box. You can pre-program your paid ads and offer uh, people who click a variety of different questions and then give them programmed responses, getting a ton of um, practical engagement from this tool and a lot of user social endorsement. So, uh, Cindy, I'm going to wrap in just a few minutes here because we're right about the hour, but I want to cover one more topic before we do. So, we talked about digital. We talked about a lot of things. One last topic I want to talk about is more traditional advertising. So, OTT it means in Connected TV, it really refers to advertising, for example, on Hulu. So, it's kind of a part of traditional TV, but you can actually run these ads now through the same programmatic buying platform and run ads on just Hulu. Um, and other streaming services that ha allow ads. Uh, likewise, um, usage of like iHeartRadio, Pandora, Spotify uh, have skyrocketed because people are not driving as much. So digital radio is skyrocketing. And so usage of digital audio. So these are a little bit more sophisticated um, and they can be adjuncts to your advertising plan. And then finally, uh, traditional advertising um, if you're asking us what our thoughts are there, and this again is somebody who's has the right mindset, budget, and all that, but streaming radio and then traditional television are some of our favorite opportunities right now. Billboards and print, not so much. Um, viewership and ownership, as I said earlier, are way up, yet advertisers are fleeing the marketplace due to COVID. What does that mean when you have less advertisers and more um, inventory, right? Prices go down. So create ads that have positive messaging and are about to the community, relevant for the time we're in. If you have an agency media buyer that knows what they're doing, they can get some great deals for you. Um, you know, a media agent is, you know, will buy more than pay for the commission on this. And uh, we're, our media buyer right now is asking all of our clients for, or all of our media outlets for more. And it helps when you have somebody who's been in the market and has relationships. This world of media buying is very much based on relationships. So if you have a media buyer, for example, our um, buyer in Chicago was able to negotiate 83 community-oriented radio spots while adding in some inline streaming for audio. Likewise, in Texas, he was able to, one of our multi-location businesses, 
Um, we wanted to move out of TV um, for this month, and the rep actually provided us 180 free spots for radio just as a measure of long-term goodwill. Pretty amazing. So if you're doing advertising and you really want to have more of a um, market presence, there's some big opportunities here right now. So some final words, and I'm going to turn the ball back over to Cindy. Um, we're going to have, um, before I do, I've got a couple things I want to cover, Cindy. Um, number one, there is pent-up demand. A lot of people have been out putting off getting care, um, but some of these personas will act sooner than later. Uh, others, some will be able to jump right in, others are gonna be more cautious. It's just human nature. A lot of campaigns are getting interest, but conversion rates may be lagging behind historical norms. You wanna monitor results continuously and stay uh, prepared to pivot. The recovery will take time. Treat, please try to be patient. Um, so these are some really important thoughts. Um, also, things will likely never be the same again, but that yields new opportunities. You know, the greatest example of that would be telemedicine. That's such an obvious one. This is my contact info, and uh, Cindy's going to share it again in a moment. I did mention a lot of different content that's available to you. So if you'd like to get more content, like I've been referring to, it's zero cost. Just email Kyle, K-Y-L-E, at healthcaresuccess.com, and we'll be taking some questions. So please... Make sure you start feeding the questions in and Cindy will be asking those for me later. I think Cindy, you have some announcements as well. Yes, thank you very much, Stuart. Uh, great information. Um, hopefully uh, those listening will take advantage of it and, and start doing some of it. Um, I wanted to um, go on with just some of the resources that the AOA has. This is our physician support line that we're just advertising, it's not AOAs, um, for any physicians out there that are just struggling and just really need some, um, someone to talk to. So wanted to put that out there. And then our, our osteopathic.org COVID-19 page that's updated regularly with everything that's going on, on in this pandemic. And then we have the, our on-demand webinars, our webinars that we've been doing um, since the uh, pandemic started. Uh, we've got the telemedicine, billing coding, the federal relief. So there's all sorts of stuff there. So please take a look at those on demand. And then we have our upcoming webinars. I mean, obviously tonight's and then next week we have managing your online presence and then we have the um, updated telemedicine coding and billing that'll be coming as well as a COVID-19 impact on the employed physicians and then a reopening of your medical practice so um, watch for those um, registrations to open um, and the dates to be confirmed on that and then again, as I mentioned previously, to obtain your CME credit, you're gonna go back to the AOA online learning platform and um, go in and within each course, you will find the post evaluation. You can print or, or download that and we will re be reporting uh, the CME credit to the AOA CME department as well. And then Physician Services Department, this is our direct line, as well as the email. Um, you have a question about something that's going on in your practice or something that you're not sure about that you wanna know from the AOA, you can send it there. And if it is not something that we can answer in Physician Services, what we do is we find the right department in the AOA to help you and to answer that question. So. And now we will go to questions. And I can't believe there is not one question in the Q&A box. <laughs> I think you overwhelmed them with, uh, with everything. You know, it's really funny. I just had my last webinar. I did, I did another one this morning, and I had a bunch of questions that I can refer to. If nobody asks any questions, I'll share some of the ones I had this morning. Yeah, please do. And if anybody has any questions, please type them in now. All right. Sure. So the... Um, is it okay if I just show my contact info again so they yes, can see it? Yes, absolutely. So let me put that up. Where is my clear button? 
So again, we have lots of information and like, I'll just talk about some of the things. So um, search engine optimization was a question that came up in the one I did earlier this morning. And they said, hey, Stuart, we're getting a lot of calls um, from you know, people pitching search engine optimization. And my warning there was, the problem with SEO is it can be really fantastic, but um, the, the firms there, it's just really varies. There's some really good ones and there's a lot of sort of shysters. It's, I don't know what it is. Um, if somebody's offering you $700 a month or something, it's probably, they're not doing much. So real SEO requires content um, and it requires ongoing effort and real strategy. So just the secrets to SEO require number one, creating again, just really good content. Um, keywords and simple stuff are, are really important, uh, but the content's even more important. There's something called schema uh, that we'll be talking about. Um, well, actually really interested in SEO. I have another white paper on enterprise level SEO you can take a look at. But um, SEO again is really um, kind of all over the board. Another question we had this morning was, um, you know, how do you create a marketing plan? And again, I've mentioned earlier, if you're serious about marketing the practice, you really want to get a, um, uh, uh, to think through, okay, what are our objectives? You know, both qualitatively and quantitatively. Think through um, what are your uh, 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 target audience? You know, what kind of uh, patient are we looking for? Mentally, psychographically, income-wise, you know, all those kinds of things. Um, it's very different if you're going after a broad audience versus a very targeted audience. Um, think through your uh, uh, budget, think through your, uh, what makes you unique, create a positioning which answers why you. Um, those are the kinds of things that you wanna do. And then again, just simply break it down into those six categories. Any questions yet, um, Cindy? No, no. All right, let's pause. I want to see, uh, I'll think of another one while we're waiting for anybody else to throw in here. We still have a lot of participants left, so somebody must have some questions. You're all still here. Come on, you know you want the answer. <laughs> it's funny, uh, when I uh, managed a practice um, years ago, we had a new doc start, a new GI doc, um, and he was worried that there were too many GI docs in that hospital and that, you know, he wasn't going to get any patients. And I told him, don't worry, I'll get you patients. And what I ended up doing is, and this tells you how long ago it was, you know, maybe like four times a day, different, you know, twice in the morning, twice in the afternoon, I would have him paged overhead in the hospital. So, I love that. You know, other doctors all heard his name being mentioned and you know they're talking trying to figure out who is this guy he's here all day long you know uh, i love that it's funny i have a similar story a friend of mine uh, one of our favorite clients dr fang is an oncologist and he was very active at his hospital and he kept saying you know they, but it was it was legitimate you know calling dr fang he was like who's dr fang and then the patient's like you must be fantastic so that's really funny. That's it. Another question yeah. that comes up a lot, uh, Cindy, that, you know, on that note that you brought up, what's really great about marketing, um, we have a couple more ideas here for your audience while we're wrapping up. One is, um, you know, what do we do to support new doctors? And, um, or it could be support a new location. It could be to support a new um, uh, technology. And I've seen this issue about marketing um, almost tear practices apart. I once, I got, I still remember going to a neurosurgery group in um, uh, Arizona where they had, I think, 24 doctors, 12 neurosurgeons, and 12 neurologists. And, um, you know, roughly two or three were highly pro, two or three were just dead set against, and everybody else was in the middle. But the ones that were older and dead set against, you know, would say things like, well, just be, you know, available, affable, and able. And younger doctors are like, that was a different world. Um, so I would urge you to recognize that if you have younger doctors and they're not getting the traction they want, it's not because they're lazy. It's just much, much harder. Um, so another thing to think through is that, um, you know, building relationships with their doctors takes active effort. It just is not the same thing. It's just, I hear this every day. So it's more than being able, affable, and available. Um, that's why we oftentimes have the physician liaisons. That's why we often use the digital marketing. Another thing that did not come up yet is consumer direct. Um, so 
the uh, meaning that patients now are consumers. They are and uh, they are choosing their own doctors. Thank you very much. I mentioned earlier, even when somebody's being referred by their primary care doctor to a specialist. The overwhelming majority of patients check them out online and decide if they're going to do that. And uh, amazingly, if they don't like the website, they may very well um, you know, go to somebody else or at least call somebody else. So those are some things to think about as well, that today healthcare is super consumer direct. Um, Absolutely. I, and, and I think one of the other things that marketing, you know, is that, that script like you mentioned with your front desk people. I mean, a front desk person is the first person, anybody from your, pra you know, that representing your practice. And if you've got someone there that can't answer the question or that, you know, comes off a, a little too short or something with somebody, they're, that's going to, they'll keep shopping. They'll keep shopping, you know. Yeah, for uh, sure. And it could be just a simple thing instead of just saying, please hold, asking, can you hold and waiting for them to answer? Um, yep. You know, so um, all sorts of that, those type of things all play into uh, putting yep. a positive image out there on your practice. Hey, we're getting our favorite, we're getting, and people are warming up. <laughs> Um, got so some question, questions here. How best to handle a negative online review? Right. And then another one was, what's the best way to ask for a positive patient? Positive review, right. We're really interested in that. So let me uh, do a little, you, the, you, the, most of our audience is still here. I'm proud of you guys. You all get A's. Mm -hmm. um, so the, um, let me give you some uh, bonus material on reviews. So first of all, uh, when it comes to your own practice name, you want to dominate the first page of um, Google. So clearly when people Google the name of the practice or each individual doctor, you want to dominate the page to the extent that you can. So how do you do that? Well, first of all, when it comes to your practice name, you should have, this is an area where, you know, we're not big on Pinterest, for example, for drawing in new patients, but having a well-stocked Pinterest account would be just another social media page. So that if, they, if you have a YouTube channel, a Pinterest page, a Facebook page, an Instagram page, um, Twitter, all these different things uh, are just more media properties for your business. Um, and so when you have those, um, then you're more likely to get, um, to have that show up in addition to your practice website. And then as you start speaking and start being active, again, they're gonna see many more uh, instances of your business um, because you're dominating the page with lots of content. So the first step is to try to push everything else off your website or off the page. Right now, sadly, so many doctors, and I bet if I were to audit um, participants here, I would see that a lot of them, you know, their own website's not even showing up, right? Health Grades is showing up. Yelp is showing up. I don't want that. I want, it's really tragic. If you have other people showing up under your name, you have to fight to own that real estate, right? So the first step is to create properties, create content, and push that other stuff off. Then a review for your practice name, like, you know, Mountainside, um, you know, family practice or whatever. Um, once you own that, then you also want to start thinking about reviews for Mountainside. So that's a little harder because you are more likely to get rating sites, right? But the step one was try to push stuff off the page as much as you can with good content. Step two is, okay, how do I get positive reviews? So there's a number of ways to do this. Uh, I'm gonna give you a, a precursor. Yelp hates you even asking for reviews. Yelp is completely against this. It's against their terms and policy. Um, they are on the extreme. It's a religion to them. Uh, Yelp also happens to be the same company that somehow doctors tell me ignores all their positive reviews but puts up only negative reviews. So that's a wrap they've had a long time. If you Google, like, I'm not saying they're doing this, but if you Google the words Yelp and extortion, you'll see lots of people are not happy with Yelp. So um, uh, anyway, so but Yelp does matter. Facebook, Google, those are the big ones. In medicine, there's lots of other ones. Um, we actually use a couple different rating and referral services depending on the client. So I don't have an endorsement for you here because we use several. Um, the, um, but whatever, we, whatever you can do, if you just think about this logically, 
one thing you can do is simply put a sticker in your window, you know, um, saying, you know, please rate us on whatever uh, platform it is. Better than a slap in the face, but not super powerful. Um, another thing you can do is um, email all your patients and just say, hey, would you mind rating us? You can do that, but it's a little scary, right? Because you may not like what they get, what they say. Um, so that's an option as well. Um, some services have a, uh, now, uh, I, I was thinking about this just before this meeting, those kiosks where people fill out the review while they're sitting in your office, there's all kinds of reasons before COVID to not use those, but now there's really, really a reason not to do that, right? You don't want to have a, I'm not going to touch a dirty iPad. So, um, some services will allow you to text the patient while they're there or text them after they leave. Um, sometimes you can email patients. Um, you can ask them to do it, but everybody has their phone. So the phone has a big advantage uh, because it's theirs and they feel comfortable with it. Um, on the hierarchy, email is sort of like a penny. Um, texting somebody is a quarter and asking them directly, then would you mind referring us as a dollar just because it's more committal, right? So that can all be done. The challenge with that is it requires someone on your staff to do something and that's hard. So there are automated systems out there. Again, we use several, so I don't want to endorse one today because we use different ones for different purposes. Um, but the, there are some out there that make this automated where they can either email patients in mass or link with their uh, medical records. One of the things that we do uh, to, for some clients is there are systems out there that can um, do a survey of your patients and then later on you can go back and ask the happier ones that you know are relatively happy to um, review you. So there's a lot of different iterations of that. Uh, the advantage of those kinds of programs though, and by the way, um, that one is something that not all practices feel comfortable with and certainly Yelp isn't excited about that. Um, but the, there's a lot of different options out there, but hopefully that was helpful to you. Um, but the key though is automating as much as you can, um, whether you're emailing them or texting them, asking your front desk person to remember. If she'll do it, fantastic. You know, if you ask everybody that comes through and text them a link afterwards, it's fantastic. Um, uh, or using one of these automated platforms. So hopefully that was helpful to your audience there. Um, um, so yeah, I covered both those questions right there. All right, next question was, uh, what if the patient fears the pandemic and returning to the office um, because of COVID-19? Well, first of all, um, the... Uh, I really think that comes down to several things. I, I mentioned this kind of earlier. One is I would create a really good video um, and a page for your website. I think that's essential. And I would trade your front, train your front desk. And you know, one thing you might be able to do is have the front desk talk to them. And then um, you know, if they really, really are still fearful, what I might do after the end of that is email them a link to the video and the website and say, hey, I totally get it. You know, this just, you know, maybe too scary for you at this point. I don't blame you. Um, you know, everybody has to make their own decisions here. We are ready here and ready for you when you're ready. So I wouldn't turn it into a big sales pitch because that would be off-putting. It's legitimate to have a fear, right? I think so. So if they, they're just not ready, they're just not ready. But another thing you can do is put follow-ups with them. Would it be okay if I follow you, follow up with you? Uh, yeah, that's fine. Well, give me a sense. When do you think you might be more comfortable? Because if they commit to letting you follow up, that gives you another option in. So, um, that's what I would do. A couple other things I want to cover before we wrap up here, Cindy. Um, some other questions that inspired have just occurred to me from my previous webinar that I think were both relevant. Um, one practice said, you know, I want to start doing elective care. Um, and how do I do that? And um, in this particular case, because it was for a vein webinar, he was a family practitioner and he wanted to do veins, right? Varicose vein removal through one of the different um, ablation techniques out there. And so I told him, you know, that's, first of all, I wrote a book on this about cash pay healthcare. So that's a big decision. So, you know, there's our book and there's other stuff out there that you could reference. Um, but I, the short answer is I'm a conservative guy and I sure wouldn't just, you know, close my family practice and start doing veins. Um, if you want to be successful in some of these markets, um, usually it does take a pretty big commitment. Um, and that particular shit, by the way, veins is much harder now. The easy uh, days are over. Uh, it's highly competitive and much more sophisticated. But what I recommended there was to create either a set special microsite or a um, landing page that's all about veins. And then um, 
create a, because that's a different business. So when you start getting into that kind of stuff, you really have to recognize that you're in a new business. Patients that are looking for vein removal don't want to know that you're, you know, they're going to be in the lobby with colds and sniffles or COVID or whatever. So it really becomes another business. So not to be misleading, but when you start getting into these things that are consumer direct, first of all, you have to have some place to send them, whether it's a really good page on your website, not the homepage, or a landing page, a separate one page, you know, sales page essentially, or a microsite, you need some place to send them. You need marketing to grow it, both, you know, the stuff that we talked about, Facebook, Google, um, you can do communications to your internal team or your internal patients with your email or as people come in, you can do signage. And then um, another th the thing is, though, you have to recognize as you get into these kinds of things, it's a new business. It's a retail business. So, you know, another great example of this, I remember once when I was first doing this years and years ago, Durham told me, he's like, you know, Stuart, in our group, you either like aesthetics or you don't. Like my colleagues over there say, what the heck's wrong with you? Your, your skin's healthy. You should be happy. Shut up. Go home. Whereas this doctor really liked aesthetics, right? His philosophy was completely different. So it's important that the doctors understand that you're creating a new business and it's important that you embrace this as a new business. And that means how you answer the phone for those patients. They're going to be much more likely to shop. They're going to be much more likely to ask about pricing. If it's aesthetic um, or if it's um, anti-aging and things like that, I co-wrote my book with Dr. Mark Tager, who's big in the anti-aging arena. Some of your doctors probably know him. Um, you know, I've spoken with Mike, Mark a bunch of times. We just wrote our book together. But, you know, this idea of getting into cash pay is a big decision. But the things I can tell you is, A, be ready to promote it. B, you're in a new business. You need to understand a retail mindset. It's very, very different. You know who fails? And hopefully none of the people left on our webinar today have done, are in this category. But the people that fail are the ones that, listen to the device manufacturer and buy a $60,000 or $100,000 box that does, you know, laser this or weight loss that or whatever. And they, they believe they're going to get everything they need from a, um, you know, a website. And then they do nothing to market their practice and they treat everybody like a, a new, uh, you know, a family practice. Those are just not likely to be very successful. Yeah. It's a completely different mindset. Yeah. And the fact that we have a DO audience I think a lot of the um, opportunities you have, I mean, I feel like healthcare is moving toward osteopathy, right? Because, you know, my wife, for example, um, you know, when I first met her, she had an osteopath and she didn't know what it was, I had to tell her. But, you know, she's much more interested in, you know, sort of an integrative medicine approach or more holistic approach and sort of the philosophy and treatment methods of uh, osteo osteopathy are really, um, you know, well suited for that. So those are some things you can think about. Um, one other thing that came up today, and this is just something to keep in mind, for the larger businesses that are on the line, um, the, um, you know, we have sort of a sub-area of expertise of working with multi-location practices, not just, you know, so we would certainly work, we have products with the little guys, you know, like sort of turnkey websites uh, and, you know, easy marketing programs, so we have that, we call it patient fetch. But for the enterprise level, if any of your, um, anybody in the audience has, has an enterprise level business, just keep in mind, I'll share with you some things there. Number one, it's all about scale. So when it comes to marketing, you have to come up with a way to recognize that if you have 50 locations, you don't, you're not marketing one business, you're marketing 50 businesses, each with a different location. So as you start building marketing programs for a business like that, you just have to recognize that, you know, the personnel are different. Some practices will need more help than others. The capabilities, you know, I've worked with a number of multi-location Durham practices, for example. You know, some offer aesthetics, some don't. Some have, um, you know, extenders, some don't. Some have doctors who are sold out for months, others don't. So you really have to take each location as its own business and creates essentially a marketing plan that works for, you know, really any of those different aspects. Well, Stuart, you gave us a wealth of information, great information. Um, if anybody has questions after the fact that they think of, don't hesitate to reach out to either Stuart or myself, and I'll make sure to get you an answer from Stuart. And I thank you all for joining us this evening. And uh, this concludes our webinar. Thanks thank again, you, Stuart. Thank you so much, Cindy. Take care. Bye-bye.